remember that we have our book study that we have just started, The Invisible War. Even if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to plan on being here. And or if you want to join us on Zoom, you can join us on Zoom as well. Just make sure I have your email so when I send the invitation out uh, today that you'll get it. So I uh, encourage you to participate either here in person or on Zoom. Also, um, tomorrow, uh, hopefully, hopefully, depending on what the weather does to us, <laughs> there is the Hebron Youth Skating Event. And uh, so tomorrow night, it actually starts at 4 o'clock from 4 to 8, I believe it is. Uh, so you'll need to make sure that you have one of these forms teams if you're planning on going or if you're going to get one of your friends to go, make sure they have one of these forms to be able to fill the back out uh, before they come. Also, teams, remember to make sure you grab your note paper to be able to fill that out so that you have that and then to be able to participate with the, with the note taking as well as the quizzing and be able to earn your way to some of the other events. The next event after the skating one coming up that we have, there is March 21st. There's a flyer out on the back table. It looks like this. It says March 21st, and that is going to jump. No, go to the trampoline place. Uh, so anyway, make sure you grab one of those uh, to be able to be able to take and invite some of your friends to come to that. I think that that's all in the way of announcements. So let's begin our worship time together. Let's stand together uh, and start with a word of prayer before we go to our first song. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning and we thank and praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be able to study your word. Thank you for your word that you have given to us that reveals who you are, your greatness, your majesty, your plan. Lord, I just pray that you would open the eyes of our heart today, that we would be able to understand your truth and apply it to our lives. We pray for those that are hurting today physically, Lord, and not able to be here. We ask that you would minister to them in a special way, encourage them, strengthen them. For those emotionally that are hurting, Lord, I pray that through the ministry of your Holy Spirit, that they would know that you love and care for them. Lord, I pray that you would... Uh, work in the lives of those that we've had opportunity to minister to. We pray for those that uh, would come with the teams, Lord. I pray that you would uh, work in their lives. Thank you again for all that you bless us with. Bless our time together this morning as we lift our voices in song to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing together. Our God reigns.
church as we sing this one, Amazing Grace, My Change of God. <coughs> the parables of Jesus. As we're going through the parables of Jesus, we have been able to look at a lot of different parables. And one of the things that you're going to find when you go through the parables, there's a couple of things that you cannot go through the parables of Jesus without repeatedly hitting upon. One of them is commitment. Are you committed to Christ? You're going to, that's going to be something that's going to come up over and over again. Another one is going to be money. Of course, none of us like to talk about money, but we talked about that one last week, right? Okay. And then another one that quite often people do not like to talk about is hell. And Jesus made more comments about hell than he did heaven. And so you cannot possibly go through the parables of Jesus without dealing with hell. This morning, I've entitled the message this morning, and I put some sheets there for you too. Um, she has them, I think, over there. Um, <clears throat> if you want to <clears throat> start with the title one, okay. Um, it is Surprised by Hell. Now, I believe there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be surprised by hell. But none of us need to be, because Jesus taught about it repeatedly. As we look here, I want to use a couple of illustrations, first of all, to help us to think through this. First of all, when Henry David Thoreau was on his deathbed, he was visited by a minister who urged his dying friend to be ready for death. Do you know where you're going in the next world? Thoreau waved him away with his words, 
one world at a time. His attitude has caused humanists to uphold him as a man of moral courage, resisting a cowardly flight to religion. He was, in fact, the model of a fool. Many people say, well, who was da Henry David Thoreau, you might ask? He was an American naturalist, an essayist, a poet, a philosopher, a leading transcendentalist. He is best known for his book, Walden, A Reflection Upon Simple Living in Natural Surroundings, and his essay, Civil Disobedience. He was born in 1817. He died in 1862 and was surprised by hell. Okay? No matter what he thought about it, you can mark it down, he was surprised by hell. See... We live in a world where many people have a lot of attitudes. This one here. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan. By the way, this is the son of the former president, Ronald Reagan. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. I'm alarmed by the intrusion of religion into our secular government. And that is why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the, na the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics. Now, he went on and he made some comments about the separation of church and state, which is absolutely wrong from what the constitutional writers uh, had for. Remember, the separation of church and state was always to protect the church from the state because they had come out of England in that area where the church was the government and it ran people's lives. And so that's what it was about, not what he says. But notice, Ron Reagan, this is how he concludes this whole thing. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. He will one day be surprised by hell. Amen. Okay? Now, that wasn't 150 years ago. That wasn't 150 years ago. This was a commercial in last year's Democratic National Convention. That's when, this was, that's when it was first shown. See, this is amazing that somebody would have the audacity on national television to make these kind of statements, but that's where we are in our world today. A poll taken in the United States in 1978 revealed that more than 70% of those interviewed said they believed in hell. However, 11 years later, a Newsweek magazine survey produced a figure of just 58%. A poll conducted in Australia in 1988 indicated that only 39% believed in hell, while in 1989, a Gallup poll taken in Britain revealed that no more than 24% of those questioned believed in hell. Listen, it's not about what you think. It's not about what somebody else thinks. It's not about what Ron Reagan thinks. There is a hell. And if you believe in heaven, you also have to believe there's a hell. Because Jesus talked more about hell than he ever did about heaven. And the reason I believe is because if we really grasp and understand what hell is like, then we will have a passion that not only will we not want to be there, but we won't want anybody else to be there either. And it will drive us and motivate us to share God's truth and grace with anybody and everyone who will listen. See, James Mason made this statement. He said, the reason why so many fall, quote unquote, into hell is because they because so few think of it. Everybody likes to talk about heaven, don't they? Everybody likes to talk about heaven, but not quite so many about hell. Everybody likes to talk about this, this perfect love and relationship with each other. John Lennon, I wouldn't use him as a major philosopher. <clears throat> John Lennon was sadly mistaken when he wrote a popular song in the 1970s called Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. See, you look at it, and it's a concept that within our world is growing and has been growing that we have just today. That's it. All you have is today. Live for today. There's nothing else. Well, when you do that, you need to remember that virtually everybody who does believe in heaven, Gallup poll showed, that they also believe that they're going to go there. <laughs> oh yeah, there's a heaven. And, oh yeah, it'll be wonderful. Such was the case with the rich man in this story before us today. 
both to himself and others, he would have seemed to be a, a lock for heaven. He would have, man, this, this, if this guy isn't going there, who in the world can? The Jews believed that riches were a sure sign of God's blessing. Therefore, the more money you had, the more blessing. Now, you can go back to the book of Job, even all the way back in the days of Abraham in the book of Job, when Job is there. Even his friends approached him based on what? Well, Job, if you're having these problems, most of you've done something against God because the only reason God blessed you the way that he did was because you have all this money and all this stuff because God has blessed you. You're in, you're in close relationship with God. But now that it's all taken away, it must be you've done something wrong. Go over to Matthew with me. Just turn, hold your finger here in Luke because we're going to come back. This is all just introduction, okay? Go over to Matthew. In Matthew chapter 19, in verse 23, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why did Jesus bring that statement forward? Because a rich man had asked him, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him, go and sell what you have and give to the poor. After he had got done already saying the commandments. And he says in verse 21, if you want, wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But this, when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. Materialism keeps many from following Jesus. See, Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Now notice the disciples' response. Notice their thinking on this whole idea of riches. When they say in verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Remember Jesus here, where we are this morning, in Luke chapter 16, is just finishing here. He's talking with the religious leaders in response to the fact that they were scoffing at him because they were lovers of money. Notice, he goes on then, right after he is dealing with them, he goes on and he says, verse 19, now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. See, he goes right from that into where we are today, because the people of his day, the Pharisees, believed that if you had stuff, if you had money, if you had wealth, then must be you're in some kind of special relationship with God in order to get all that. And it's not much different than people today. There are many people today who believe that as long as they go to church, as long as they pray, as long as they give to the church, then they're okay. The problem is, what have you done with Jesus? See, we think that we can live any way we want and it won't matter. Yet, the Word of God specifically says, Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. When you go over, for instance, to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, He reminds them, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. He reminds them, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. A lot of people headed down the wrong road, the wrong path. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's pretty narrow, isn't it? In other words, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. It's a narrow, very narrow way. But yet today... People think it doesn't matter how I live, what I say, what I do, because as long as I go to church, as long as I'm a good person overall, then when it comes to heaven and hell, my good will outweigh my bad, and I'll end up in heaven someday. That's not what the Bible says. 
As a matter of fact, we're reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he reminds us, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? You say, well, phew, that's the unrighteous, that's not me. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. In other words, you don't have to remain in that condition, but if you continue as a way of life to live that way, then what he says is, you don't have eternal life abiding in you. That's not some Baptist preacher telling you that. That's the Word of God. Also in the book of Galatians, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's pretty straightforward. You don't need a Baptist preacher to interpret that for you. Okay? All we have to do is what? Read it. Read it. The way is narrow. It's all about Jesus. What have I done with Jesus? So Jesus is going to help these Pharisees to understand that their worldview is wrong. Much like many, even in churches in America today, their worldview is wrong. See, he's going to help them as he talks about this rich man. I'm sure as he's talking about this rich man, they're like, where in the world is he going with this? But notice the rich man. There are two different lives. Two totally different lives. You have a rich man and you've got a poor man. And in this, the rich man habitually dressed in purple. Notice the, the wording, habitually dressed in purple. Now you think, well, anything's better than for a man to dress in pink, but... Well, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a darker pink there. So it's a, I saw it before I said it, so don't worry. <laughs> but the reality is, what is this purple that he's talking about? The purple that he's talking about, there was a lady in the book of Acts from Thyatira. Her name was Lydia, and she was a seller of purple. It was a special chemical they used from the shell, and it was that which was very, very expensive. As a matter of fact, in that day, the, the, it, the dye that was obtained from the shellfish murks, that dye was so expensive because there was so little put out of each one of them, and it was, had to be harvested from deep in the ocean, that because of it, in the sea, because of it, it was worth more than gold per weight. In other words, by its weight, it was worth more than gold. So when you look at it, habitually dressed in purple, it pictures him day after day clothing himself, incredibly luxurious garb that people would look at and say, wow, this guy is rich. This guy has it. See, that's why it was so costly. And fine linen. This fine linen, he was not a fruit of the loom guy. Nor Haynes. He did not shop at Walmart, okay? He had it delivered special for him. Because this fine linen came from special flax that grew along the banks of the Nile River. This was amazing stuff. I mean, only the richest of the rich had this linen. So this guy has it all. It also says, notice it says, Joyously living in splendor every day. I mean, joyously living in splendor every day. Now, most of us, I know how it is with you. You get up in the morning, oh, and the older you get, the harder that is, you know. <laughs> okay, the, the, the more you say, oh, I got to go to work today. Okay, <clears throat> and you don't say, you don't get up in the morning and say, yeah, we're partying today. Okay, no, got to go to work today. Okay, this guy got up every day, and every day was another party. 
That's, a, that's how the wording is in the text. The wording is that he was living this way in splendor every way. He, every day. He showed off his luxury and how much he had every day. Just in how he dressed, what he did, he was flamboyant in his materialistic style and lifestyle. I mean, this guy had it all. This, I mean, this was like a Super Bowl party every day. When you look at it, you see that, man, you, I don't know about you, but you ever look at some of the money that's spent on some of these things, you know, and you're looking, you're like, wow. Okay, well, this guy did it every day. So that everybody noticed him. When you look at it, you see that not only is he living in luxury, but every day it's a lavish celebration. But Jesus is making the point. Not only is he wealthy, but he enjoyed his wealth daily. He flaunted his wealth daily. The Pharisees would have said, wow, that man, he's got to be really close to God. To have all of this. God has given him. He must be amazing spiritual individual. To have all of this. So they're looking at this. They're hearing this. And then Jesus transitions to the poor man. Whose name is Lazarus. Now interesting. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on why it is that way. Or what might be the reasons for it. But the rich man's never named. Just the rich man. But it actually gives Lazarus' name. As you look at it, it says a poor man named Lazarus. This is not Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. This is another one. It says in verse 20, And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. You look at this and you see that here you have the poor man whose name is Lazarus. And he's laid at the rich man's gate covered with sores. It is right in the rich man's face and he does nothing what? Nothing about it. He has all of this wealth. And yet he still does nothing about the rich man that is laid at his gate full of sores. Notice it says that the, the poor man, he, it doesn't say that he was at the table. It says he longed for just the crumbs falling from the rich man's table. I know sometimes when you have a dog around, it's nice to have a dog around to be able, when you do drop something, especially if you have kids. <coughs> you have kids, man, the crumbs go to the floor, the dog is like, Rah, yes, I'm there. <laughs> you know, they love it. He would have loved to have even the crumbs. He had nothing. Nothing. And yet he is that close in proximity to the rich man. He goes on and it says, the dogs came and licked his sores. The rich man didn't attend to his sores. The dogs came and what? Licked his sores. Wow. You look at the case of Lazarus here and what is happening and you see that that isn't the end of the story, though. Jesus doesn't stop there and condemn the Pharisees. What he does at this point then, he takes it as deep as he could go into the heart of the Pharisees' thinking. He says, not only are there two different lives, but here's the key. There's two different deaths and two different destinies. The two different deaths, you have the, the poor man, Lazarus. He died. Notice that here it gives Lazarus first. Now the poor man died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. When you look at that first phrase, he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. It's paradise. It's poetic for Paradise. It's the place where all the Old Testament saints were. All of the individuals in the Old Testament who by faith had believed God, just like Abraham. You go back and you look and it said, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So is the case with all of those that are there with Abraham in this place referred to as paradise. 
We don't have time to get into all of the details about this. It's referred to as Hades in the sense of the fact that you have two parts in the abode of the dead in the Old Testament and in the time of Jesus, you have two parts. We're going to see that there's a part of torment and a part of peace or paradise. This is not the future heaven. When you look at it, you see that these individuals were there with Abraham. Lazarus is there. You know what the Pharisees would have been doing at that moment? What? Their mouth hung open in disbelief. There is no way Lazarus is there. There's no way that he's carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The reason that Lazarus is in the condition he's in is because he has sinned or his parents have sinned. If you don't think so, look at some of the statements that Jesus makes when they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? See, that's their philosophy. The philosophy of the day was wrong. No, they're like mouth hung open. What, are you kidding me? And then Jesus goes to and... The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Now let me just stop right there, because at this point, he has the Pharisees' attention. You have the rich man, no name, died and was buried. Cut and dried. But in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. That reminds us that whatever else you think about hell, whatever else you think about it, it is a place of torment. It is a place of torment where Jesus said the worm does not die. There is weeping and grinding of teeth. I'll give you a whole bunch of verses on it in just a few minutes. What Jesus said about it. You would not want your worst enemy to be there. And here, the rich man lifted up his eyes being in torment. Notice what he says in verse 23. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. He is in agony in this flame. I don't know if you've ever been burned or not. But I tell you what, from what I understand, I've had some small burns, never any, I mean, one of the stupidest ones I ever did, you ever have one of those really stupid burns, you know? No? Okay. I know you're too smart for that, right, Lenny? Yeah, except when you were doing the air conditioning, that took days to get over that, probably still not over it, right? Okay. And the reality is, I remember, now this will for some of you younger ones, you don't realize that you used to have a cigarette lighter that you pushed in in the car. And then when it was done and it was nice and hot, it would pop out and it had a little red thing in it like that. That will leave a nice mark right on your thumb if you put your thumb on that. It'll leave those little rings right on your thumb. It'll totally change your whole thumbprint, okay? Man, I remember touching that thing and then grabbing my hand and saying, you idiot, what on earth were you thinking? You know, it's always on a dare from an older brother. I dare you to touch that. Yeah. Okay. Never take, forget those dares, okay? And the reality is agony, agony in this flame. Notice in verse 24, too, it says, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. There is no relief in this. There's no relief. It's constant. It never goes away. Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received the good things and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here and you are in agony. In other words, it's not just because Lazarus was poor. We know that's not the case, and it's not just because this rich man had money. Because there are people that are going to be in heaven that were wealthy. There's going to be people in hell that were poor. The bottom line comes down to, what have you done with God? What have you done with Jesus Christ? That was the key for these individuals. But 
notice there's no relief and he also has memory of the past. Now think of it. If you went to church and you heard a preacher share that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, or you read it, you've heard it, or you grew up in a family where it was shared to you, and you said, nah, some other time maybe. Maybe another day. Think of the torment of your memory for all eternity as you remember, I should have responded when I heard the message. I should have done something about it. And now I'm in this agony. I'm in this torment. I'm in this flame. I can't believe this is happening. And it's not ending. The memory of the past. That's one of the great things about heaven. Just a side note here. One of the great things about heaven is when we get into heaven in Revelation, you see that after the millennial kingdom, He wipes away all tears from our eyes and the former things of life are all taken away. It's all new. We don't have to live for all eternity with a memory of the past and what I should have done or shouldn't have done and how that would torment us. But in hell, you never escape that. Notice in verse 26. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. There is no release. There is no holding place where you start out and hopefully somewhere down the road you get to get out because somebody has prayed for you. No, there's, <clears throat> there is no response to prayer. There's no response to prayer. He begs Abraham to send Lazarus. Nope, can't be done. He begs Abraham in verse 27. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Listen, anybody in hell doesn't want anybody else to be there. When you look at those, even that I quoted, like a John Lennon, or a Thoreau, when you look at that, he could have wrote all the poetry he wanted to, but he doesn't want anybody else to come to hell. Not now, but it's too late. There's no prayer heard. There, there's no time, and there's nothing that you can pray that's going to change what is going to happen in the present or the past once you're there. Abraham said, they have Moses, and the prophets, let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. As a matter of fact, Jesus, in John chapter 5, reminded the same Pharisees the same group of religious leaders, you have all of the evidence you need. He said, first of all, you have even creation itself. And you have the Father's testimony. Remember when Jesus was baptized, remember what was said? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. You have the Scripture's testimony, He says in John chapter 5. And you won't hear it. If, if you believe the Scriptures, he said, then you would believe that I am He. The one that the Scriptures talked about. The Messiah. And then he even says, if you would believe Moses, because Moses speaks of me. See, what he is doing here, he is sharing with them over and over and over again, you need to believe who I am, Jesus says. You need to repent. Otherwise, you will spend forever in a place of torment. 
when you look at it here, he says, even if someone raises from the dead, they won't believe if they won't believe Moses and the prophets. Somebody did rise from the dead. Namely, Jesus what? He rose from the dead and the majority of them still didn't what? Still didn't believe. Even though the evidence was there. He even hung around. He was seen by over 500 at one time. He was seen by James, his brother, half-brother, who before that time didn't believe who he was. He was seen by Peter, and he was seen eventually by Paul, and he was seen by all of the disciples together. I mean, there were all of these appearances where he was able to be seen to show that he truly had risen from the dead. He even ate to show that he wasn't just simply a spirit being. And yet people still did not respond. See, when you look at Jesus' statements on hell, and we know that because of how you go through the New Testament, you understand that what was called hell early or Hades here eventually is going to become or be cast into the eternal lake of fire. I'll show you that in a moment. But Jesus' statement, here's Jesus' statements. We're not going to turn to every one of them. Fire. Eternal fire. Destruction. Away from His presence. Thrown outside. Blazing furnace. Darkness. Eternal punishment. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus twice used the word eternal to convey that it is without end. Jesus could not have been more direct in what he said about hell, eternal punishment. And yet people today are still trying to say, no, a God of love would never send anybody to hell. Well, listen, when you go into the book of Revelation, we understand that the lake of fire is created for the devil and his angels. And people will be there only because they choose to reject the gracious gift of God given us in Jesus Christ. God is long-suffering, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. We're reminded by Peter. But just like in the days of Noah, people say, ah, that thing of torment, that thing of hell, that's no way. God, God would never... You forget what happened in the days of Noah. See, in the days of Noah, they listened for a hundred years to Noah preach about a flood coming and that God was going to judge them because of their sin and their rebellion against Him. Nah. But I want to tell you, when the waters came and the floods came, they would have liked to have been in that ark. They would have loved to have been in that deliverance. And for any person who rejects God's gracious gift of His own Son, Jesus Christ, there is nothing to look forward to except the wrath of God. We are delivered from, Romans tells us, Paul writing in Romans as well as in Thessalonians reminds us that we are delivered from the wrath to come because of Jesus Christ. It's narrow. It's not about going to church. It's not about which one do you participate at. It's not about how much money do you give at church. It's not about any of that. It's what have I done with Jesus? Has there been a point in time in my life when I've recognized I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself and I cry out to God and say, God, forgive me. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for me. And in repentance, I turn to Him as my Savior and Lord. If there's never been that time in your life that that has happened, then you have nothing to look at or nothing to look forward to other than hell. When you look at what it says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14, it says, Then death and Hades 
were thrown into the lake of fire. This is a second death. Let me just stop there. When it says, then death and Hades, death claims the body. Okay? Hades claims the soul and spirit. The second death today, if you die today, just like the rich man, his body was what? Buried. But in Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment. His soul and spirit were in torment. He still had conscious existence. There isn't such a thing as soul sleep. There isn't such a thing as annihilationism. You don't cease to exist. Your body goes in the ground. Death claims that. Your soul and spirit go either to heaven. The Apostle Paul reminds us if we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then absent from the body is present with the Lord. We also remember that when he says here the second death, that means now my body and my soul and spirit are put together and those who have rejected God are going to be body, soul, and spirit forever in torment away from God. No hope. Never a chance, never a possibility of another opportunity. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. That's it, period. You don't get a second chance. You don't come back as a rat or something else and get another opportunity at it. You get one time. Either accept him or reject him. When you look, you see that the lake of fire, this is the second death, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You reject God's gracious gift in his son Jesus Christ, and your name is blotted out of the book of life. And only those who have accepted Jesus Christ and his payment for their sin and have acknowledged that he alone is the payment. He alone is my Lord and Savior. Will continue and have their name in the book of life. Don't be surprised by hell. None of us know when we're going to die. You just, there's, there's no way to say, I'm living to be 101. Can't do it. God knows the length of our days. The reality is, it could happen if you're 10. It could happen if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It could happen at any time. On top of that, the return of the Lord could happen at any time. Would you want him to come back with activities or thoughts or things that were going on in your life even this week? Or if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, if you don't know that you know that you know you're saved, if you don't know the answer to if you were to stand before God and He were to say, why should I let you into my heaven? What do you think you'd say? If you don't know the answer to that, you'd better get the answer to it because the only answer is in Jesus Christ. The only answer is because I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone because He paid for my sin. In Romans chapter 10, Verses 9 and 10, we're reminded that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's pretty straightforward. It says, for with the heart, a man believes. See, with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not hope to be, not maybe so, but has there been a point in time in your life when you know for certain this is too important to mess with? 
This is the most important decision you could ever make in your life. This is more important than who are you going to marry. This is more important than what job you're going to have. This is more important than any other choice you could ever make in your life. Your eternal destiny rests on this choice. Don't be surprised by hell. No matter how good you were, no matter how much you've done for others, it means nothing when it comes before standing before God. With every head bow, every eye closed, this is between you and God. I want to ask you again this morning, do you know for certain, do you know that you know that you know you're saved? You know there's been a point in time in your life when you have accepted Jesus Christ's payment for your sin. And that if you were to die today, you would spend forever with him. This morning, if you're here this morning, and you say, Pastor, I, I've been to church, I've heard a lot of messages, I've had times where I thought maybe, but I, I don't know for sure. But I want to know for sure. And today... I want to pray and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Are you willing to just simply raise your hand and acknowledge that? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to have you come down front. I'm going to simply say a prayer that you can also pray so that you can know for certain that in your heart, in your, in your thought business, in your life, you want to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is there anyone here this morning? I'm not going to wait long. If you're here this morning and the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, Will you raise your hand? Will you acknowledge that? Will you repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ alone? Anybody? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your love. Lord, I thank You for the opportunity to be able to share Your truth this morning. I thank You for all that You have given to us in Jesus Christ. I thank You, Father, that You have delivered us from the wrath to come. I thank you for all that you have blessed us with and all of the spiritual blessings that you have given us in heavenly places. And thank you today for the assurance that we can know for certain that we have a place in heaven secured by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.